special guest, Brooke Horn. Brooke was a co-founder of the Marriage Equality Campaign um, and has a lot that he can share with us this evening about um, how successful that campaign was. Uh, unless you didn't live in Australia um, a few years ago or uh, your head was buried in the sand, um, you would know that there uh, was a huge win a few years ago with marriage equality um, finally um, being made legal. And uh, Brooke played a key role in that. Interestingly as well, Brooke was not a professional campaigner or lobbyist or, or anything like that before that. He, there was just an issue that came along that um, he felt strongly about and he made a real impact on that. So I, I won't say any more, I'll leave the rest to Brooke. Um, so this is really uh, interesting for those of us who are newer to um, advocacy and um, you know, political action, talking with politicians, uh, campaigning. Um, it's a different way of, of approaching things when we're going straight to the decision makers and asking them to make a difference. Uh, so thank you all for joining this evening. I'm sure Brooke will provide some very interesting insights. I've seen his presentation, so uh, I know that, that he will. Um, and then we'll have time afterwards for uh, a question and answer session. And I'll talk a bit to my experience in um, campaigning and advocacy around climate and, and the environment. And crucially, what you know, what can we learn from, from what Brooke learned through the marriage equality campaign and the uh, successes there and, and any mistakes? Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to Brooke. Thanks, Al. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me along. Um, it's a nice way to spend a Monday evening. Um, Al, if you've got the presentation, I'll get you to share your screen. Um, just because I have a little presentation that I'll take you all through, but because we're a small group, um, I'll get through it as quickly as I can, just so that we can get to the interactive part and you can start to ask some questions. But basically, um, collective action is just lots of people doing lots of things with a single goal. You know, we like to put uh, fancy names on everything when we um, start to professionalise kind of campaigns, but really it's just people doing what they believe in, in the small way that they can uh, within their houses, within their um, professions, with their sporting associations um, to beat a, a, so, a social ill that they perceive, whether it's something about them, whether it's something that's occurring to a family, whether it's climate change, something else. Um, so I just wanted to kind of debunk and demyth kind of making this kind of a difficult topic. It's just normal people doing normal things and getting together with people that they know who want to achieve the same outcome. Thanks, Al. So marriage equality in Australia was a wild ride for those of us who are involved in it. And as Al said, when I came to this, I wasn't a campaigner by any stretch. I had never been in a protest march. I had never written my own placard. I'd never chanted. I'd never signed a petition, I don't think. Um, I came to this because uh, when marriage equality was being debated, I had three very young children. I was a stay-at-home dad. Um, my partner was working and... As this debate was going through, I was really feeling the emotions of a public debate that had me and my family at the centre of it and the pros and cons, as they were called. That's for climate action, achieving change through collective action. Yeah. Here we go. Um, so just go to the next, next slide for me now. Wonderful, thank you. So before I go through my experience of social, uh, of climate, um, sorry, of marriage equality, I wanted to take you through the eight stages of social movements. And I think that this really kind of sets the scene for all different kinds of social movements. This was a framework that was put together uh, in the late eighties, I think, by a guy called Bill Moyer. And he um, assessed the nuclear, the anti-nuclear movement in the US and came up with these eight different stages of how action is um, taken in social movements. And you'll see that they've got from one on the left-hand side, business as usual, when people can see that there is something wrong with politics or in society, but there is no method 
to get rid of it. And then it moves slowly through the different changes of, phase, of um, change. And you'll see there's three lines that represent public awareness, so people know about the problem, public opposition, the number of people that are opposed to changing um, the issue, and then finally down the bottom, and always the last one to reach majority is the public support. That's the tipping point when you realise that the majority of people have actually been swayed by your activism. And I like to contextualise this because this is true of any social movement. Uh, you'll see that, you know, um, the Me Too movement, for example, that's happened recently or Black Lives Matter fits into these kind of um, eight different sections. And this is really a... Um, the whole semester course at a university that I can't go through today, but it's really interesting if you wanted to have a look to kind of understand where climate fits into this at the moment. And just to contextualise where we came in, um, when I started being involved in marriage equality, it was around five and six. So really there was already public support and we came in to really get the campaign around the plebiscite across the line. Next slide, please, Al. So I think it's important to understand that social movements don't occur in isolation. And even, uh, you know, marriage equality was a global movement that had seen a wave of momentum sweeping across the globe. In 2015, uh, we'd seen the Supreme Court in the US pass marriage equality. And then a couple of months later, the Irish marriage equality campaign also went through, through a very different means of a referendum. Now, I think it's really important before we go into the Australian context to understand that even though these countries had won, there was a long process that got them to that win in 2015. In the Supreme Court in the US, there was a case that was brought by Jim Obergefell. Um, as with everything in the US, many things were achieved through litigation because the, the country is so divided. They had had over 30 different public votes on marriage equality at a state level. Some of you may have heard of Prop 8 uh, in California that actually repealed marriage equality. They were really struggling with a way to frame how to talk about people's rights and they really got it wrong for a long time. In the US, people started, people are very kind of about rights um, and they talk about things in a kind of a way that depersonalizes things. I remember what when Jim came over, he used to tell us that when they started doing their message research, they, they were starting to talk about, you know, why do you think gays want to get married? And a lot of people would say, oh, it's because they want better tax treatment. Nobody actually contextualised it, that people just wanted to be in love with their partner. And so that took them a long time to realise they needed to pull out of the weeds of marriage, uh, of the legality of what marriage equality was and really humanise it. So they went through over 30 public votes before they got there. They, they eventually won in the Supreme Court. The, marriage, the Irish marriage equality campaign did it once and got it right. Now, they had to do it through a, a, through a referendum because it was in their constitution. And to get there, they had had years and years of building public support. They knew that they couldn't go to a, to a referendum before they knew that they were going to win because they only had one chance and if they lost, that was it. So it was a very different campaign. In the US, they were just chipping away. They were trying to get it done. Um, in Ireland, they built very um, specific messaging and a really sophisticated campaign. They only pushed for a referendum once they knew that they could win. So I'll talk about this later, but knowing the politics around your issue is essential to a win. Uh, next slide, please, Al. When I started, I didn't know any of this. Um, like many of you, as I said, I was not an activist, but I could see my then partner and I could see that this issue was becoming important. So we decided to put a sign outside of Canberra Airport that said we can do this. And that was at a time when the, pol the politicians were coming back, the Liberal politicians were coming back to talk about marriage equality in the party room. And really the media was portraying this as basically a done deal. The Libs thought, the progressive Libs thought that they had the numbers and there was a huge swell of um, international momentum and we thought that it was just going to happen. So we did this little stunt thinking that, you know, this would be a nice supportive measure for those Liberal MPs coming in to welcome into the Canberra Party Room meeting. 
little did we know that um, Tony Abbott actually had the numbers and really derailed the plans that we thought was, would just be a simple vote in the Australian Parliament, which is what it would normally have been to change legislation. Next slide, please, Alan. So what we found when they went into that party room meeting was that the opposition, the people who were against marriage equality had actually done more homework than the campaign had done. They had built their numbers. They did it stealthily. They didn't report it. They didn't advertise it and they didn't put it to the media. But what they did was um, publish, uh, was garner enough support to come up with a mechanism around a plebiscite. And our plebiscite in the Australian context had never been done um, around an issue like this. The only time we had had it was around conscription back in, around the First World War and then to change the national anthem in around in the early 1980s. And that was a telephone plebiscite that um, resulted in a, the change from God Save the Queen to uh, Advance Australia Fair. So it wasn't a political process that anybody really knew well. So to say it mildly, we were turned upside down and really panicked. But that made us know that we needed to build a campaign and a national plebiscite was going to reflect and really resemble a national election. We knew that most um, parties spent about $40 million to win an election campaign. And at that time, um, Australian marriage equality had $10,000 in the bank. So we, we, we really knew that we were up against it. Next slide, please, Al. So I'm going to take you through the lessons that I learned. And I think what I want to impart to you is that these are relevant to any campaign. These are essential in terms of your messaging and the way that you keep your motivation up because campaigns are long, they are hard, and it's really difficult against opposition to keep the motivation to keep going. But the main thing you need to do as a campaigner is inspire people. And at the very core of what I was doing, as I said before, was to make sure that my children grew up in a world where their family was accepted. To do that, I thought that marriage equality needed to go through so that they could see that their parents' marriage was just as valid as anybody else's. Once the plebiscite was announced, I didn't wake up. I didn't want to wake up on the day after the plebiscite not knowing that I had not done everything in my power to make sure that their family could be um, seen as equal. So that was my inspiration. And that was the reason that I would talk about every time I got up. It's the reason when I was doing 18 hour days, six days a week, that I would get over the fatigue, get over the, you know, the depression that comes with being told that you're not equal and get out there and, you know, not fight, but just stand up for another day. And when you need, when you're finding your reason to be doing this, it was really good to be able to contextualise into an elevator pitch why you're doing what you're doing. Because if you can't tell it to yourself, you're not going to be able to tell other people. And if you can't tell other people, you won't be an authentic messenger. That's the main thing. If you hear nothing else tonight, that's the main thing. Take away two sentences as to why you're on a webinar at 7 o'clock and giving up your Monday night to fight for climate change and why you're an extraordinary messenger to be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Anne. So as I said, we knew that when we were building, we needed to learn from other examples. We'd just seen the US uh, get it done eventually. It was really hard and Ireland go through it in a much better way, but still it took an enormous toll and it was a huge lift. There are actually two other countries that have done it. On the left, France, and on the right, the UK. In France, they had done it in a way that we could have done it in Australia. They passed via legislation because they didn't have a, it wasn't enshrined in their constitution. They could pass it through legislation, which they did. And the day after, they got the biggest public protest against uh, anything that they'd seen in a long time. The, the streets were filled with people who were anti-marriage equality because they felt that the politicians had done it without them. They felt that they didn't have a say. And it's not because they didn't get to vote, it's because there had been no public debate. A lot of these things, you know, when you're talking about social change, people will often agree that they need to be brought along on the journey. And if you 
put them in a position before they're ready to be there, that is often more detrimental than it is uh, for not having had the change. Because as you'll see in places like America, with political change, those um, wins can be taken back. So we really learned from um, France and we knew that we had to build the public support to a place that they don't only agreed, but they were advocating for us because that was essential. Once you can get to people advocating to you for bipartisanship, you know that the progress that you've achieved won't be rolled back in the next political cycle. In the UK, they did it again through legislation, but they did go on that journey. In the UK, the Conservative government introduced the legislation and that was key because a lot of the reason why people, um, a lot of the proponents of, of against marriage equality were often seen as Conservatives. And David Cameron did an amazing job of creating an argument that marriage equality was a Conservative issue and a Conservative value because it really protected the family protected the institution of marriage, it let more people in, uh, and it protected the children of those families. There's a beautiful example that I was speaking to one of the donors to marriage equality, and she was um, a Jewish lady who had often confronted these kind of issues with making people feel comfortable with why we, we were, with why, you know, why she was um, doing her progressive things. And she's like, often when we come into a a place people think that we want to burn down the house but really what we want to do is plant the garden and that was part of the messaging uh, you know the, the theory behind the messaging that we took into our campaign and I just thought that was a beautiful example of meeting people where they are rather than where you want them to be if you're on this call you are obviously already very engaged in climate you know the science you know the perils of not doing anything and it can often be frustrating to meet people who don't agree with you already but your job as a campaigner is to understand where they are, understand why they're there and help bring them across. You have no other job than to get people onto your side, not through force, but, you know, through kindness, really. And being able to deliver the, mes the messages in a way that those people understand and in a way that they value, finding those values that are important to them. For us, it was family. Um, that often opens a door. We, you, we often said, you know, you're never going to um, convince somebody to vote yes if you stand at their doorway and call them a homophobe. Nobody's ever done that, you know. Um, they're not going to say, oh, well, thank you for telling me I'm going to come across and vote for you now. No, they'll slam the door and they'll get five of their friends to vote no. There was a beautiful example that I saw when I was door knocking. Um, there was a little old lady in the western suburbs, you know, that the demographic was wrong for yes, the geographical area was wrong for yes. And we came to the door and she opened it and there's always this moment of trepidation because you don't know who you're going to get at the door. And she came in and she whispered, don't worry, it's fine, I'm voting yes, but I don't know about him inside. And then him inside yells out and says, who's at the door? And she says, it's the queers. And, you know, at that moment, you know, many people could have gone, that's not how you talk about it. We're not, you know, you don't talk about queers. That's not how it works anymore. But we stopped and we just listened because we knew that that's how she had been, uh, you know, she'd come up in an era where gays were called queers and that's okay. That's how she knew us. But the most beautiful thing was that the guy at the back said, well, tell them that they've got my vote, but I'm taken. And that was the most amazing experience for us because we knew that they'd got their, that we'd had their vote. We knew that they'd be, be advocating for us and they did it in a way that made them feel comfortable with the words that they have grown up with. Um, next slide, please, Al. The third lesson, and this is the second most important, um, is to know your message. Like I said, nobody ever um, voted yes or agreed with you when you told them how wrong they were. The only person that uh, loves a fight, uh, that loves mud is a pig. So you don't fight with the pig because the pig loves mud and both of you get dirty. When we did um, the messaging, we knew that fairness and equality were the two best frames for Australians. They love a fair go. It is so cliche, but it is so true. And 
when you can bring that camaraderie camaraderie around your messaging, people really follow you. You don't want to fight. There are 10% of people for, you know, marriage quality, climate change, Black Lives Matter, um, and 10% of people against it who you don't need to engage with because they will never agree with each other. But there are 80% of people in the middle who kind of agree with one side or are kind of going towards the other, but really they don't care. And if all they see is the fighting, then they just disengage. And so that has, you know, when we talk about climate wars and cultural wars, we see that often in the media. And the media loves those kind of headlines because people click on it and, you know, it kind of garners it, it creates its own momentum. But really there are 80% of people in the middle who are just wanting to be told in a very positive way what they need to be doing and why. You know, if they don't know the climate science, science tell them. If, they don't, if they've got issues about their jobs, talk about it in a way that makes them feel comfortable with that. A lot of people have very um, legitimate fears around change because change is scary and they don't know what their lives looks like, look like on the other side of it. So having those answers available um, for whatever campaign you're working in is really important. Next slide, Al. Lesson four is that the messenger is just important as the message. Vets for Climate Action is an amazing group because you are already trusted. We knew when we did our campaign that there were a number of different messenger, messengers that were super important. One of them was mums. Everybody has children. Every mother has children. Um, statistically, one in five, one in four, you know, of those children might be gay. And when they're under the age of 10, you don't want to pick which one has less rights than the other. So they become very effective messengers because they talk about the equality of all of their children. The clergy were also hugely supportive, because hugely important for us because they were seen as not the usual suspects. Many of the people in the No campaign legitimised themselves because they came from the, the church and it was like the head of a lot of the churches that were, you know, came up publicly against marriage equality. But the people who actually went to church, the congregations, you know, um, they were majority for marriage equality. Catholics were some of our biggest supporters. So being able to contextualise this change with a religious angle was also really important because it demystified um, the difficulty that some people had of going to church but also voting for marriage equality. In Ireland, you know, a country that um, is majority Catholic had huge success because they disseminated these messengers of uh, equality and togetherness through the trusted message, messengers of the clergy and that really allowed a lot of people to come across. Then you've got national icons like Thorpey who everybody loved, you know, people, he is completely ingrained into the national psyche. And when he came out, a lot of people said that was a turning point for me because I looked up for him. I didn't understand the pain he was going through. And when he spoke about it publicly, they thought, oh, if somebody that I love, you know, some people had a gay child or they knew somebody at work that was gay, but for people who didn't, everybody knew Thorpey. And when they could see him going through that process and they knew that they loved him because he's a national icon and a great swimmer, there was no reason for them to go, well, I can't believe that he's not happy or that he can't get married. I think that's wrong. And so that really enabled them to then vote yes. The other thing was, you know, we've got a cohort in um, ELA, Farmers for Climate Action, um, because they're so trusted and they're so nationally iconic. It was the same in marriage equality. You get two gay farmers, um, and people go, oh, I just thought that um, gay people live in Newtown and Fitzroy. No, there's people, there's gays everywhere. Um, they're on farms at cattle farmers. They drive trucks and showing people that and getting these messengers to talk about that authentically was a huge success for us. Uh, next slide down. So I mentioned this before, but knowing the political context is absolutely essential. You can have the best messaging uh, and then the best messengers, but if you don't pick your timing right, then it's all going to fail. 
with marriage equality, we knew that we were on the upward swing. The plebiscite was on its way. There was a lot of pressure being put on the then prime minister to allow this to happen. But that didn't come easily. You know, we had, as well as the public campaign, we had the inside campaign where we were lobbying all sides of politics to get to bipartisanship, to allow this to go through and depoliticise the whole process. And if we didn't make sure that that internal ecosystem of politicians and parties were talking and working together, then the, the plebiscite could have completely failed. And it did at one stage. You know, I can take, take you back to that um, social movement plan. And there is a point there where it's called activist failure, where you think that the whole campaign is lost. Oh, yeah, you can go back down. Yeah. Number five, activist failure. We had a point in the campaign where, rightly so, people who were for marriage equality said a plebiscite is an absolutely terrible way to do marriage equality. It is unnecessary, it is costly, and it puts a minority uh, right to the vote of the majority. It is against every principle that we stand for as a liberal democracy. We elect politicians to do this, and not doing it through the parliament is an abrogation of your duty. And that one, and the, the plebiscite was actually um, struck down. But then it got back up when it became a postal plebiscite and we were back on. But, you know, we thought that we had lost at that point because the political context was on a razor edge. And four years later, I can sit here and look like, you know, we succeeded. I can tell you that at the time we were so close to that falling over the other side. It's not to say that it would not have happened eventually, but at that time, it was definitely very precarious. So knowing that political context is really important. Thanks, Al. Next slide. And then once you've got all of that in place, you just have to hope for the best because there is nothing that you can do that will actually win um, in its own right. When you are part of a movement, it would, and you're part of its climate um, action, you sit within a cohort, a group, and a movement that is playing towards different parts, and you're all moving towards one outcome, but you're never assured that you're all going to achieve it collectively. You might set the right conditions to get there, but there's no one action that anybody can actually identify to say that that's the thing that caused us to win. And for the marriage quality campaign, that is absolutely right. Uh, even when we went to the plebiscite, knowing that we had public support, knowing that we had beaten the opponents in terms of the messaging, we knew that we had um, the country on our side. We still didn't know that we were going to win the campaign because the process was so confusing. Our whole messaging strategy at the, at, during our advertising campaign was teaching the people who we knew would vote for us what a post box was. Most people were under 25. They'd never posted a letter. So uh, we had to do a campaign with Thorpey that actually took people with their um, postal ballot and show them what a red letterbox looks like. So there's things like that that you have to think about uh, in the process of doing these campaigns that you wouldn't think are necessarily intuitive, but you've kind of got to step back. And that context and that um, environment means that you're never really assured that you're going to win. All you can do is make sure that you have identified all of the things that you think you can and um, really put the best conditions in place. Uh, and I think that's it, Al, uh, one more. Yeah, so four years ago, last Monday, a week ago, last week, we won. 61.6% .6 said yes, which if that was replicated in uh, an election would be the greatest electoral landslide in Australian history, which is an amazing achievement but I kind of, I think the important thing here, and if it's something I want to get across to you, is that 73% of people four months before had said that they were in support of marriage equality. And we had about 90% um, return, return rate. So during the course of the campaign, the no campaign really chipped away at our support. So when you're running a positive campaign, the people who are opposing progress or opposing the change will always have the upper hand because they sit within the status quo and the status quo doesn't change people are scared of change and so they have an up they have an advantage 
So even though, you know, at the moment it's with um, climate action, we are going through what I think is a huge wave of awareness. People are really understanding after COP what needs to happen. We've seen the conservative media and news, and news corp start to really change their tune on this. But even though there is momentum, that can always be taken back if you're not forever vigilant. So that 61% is always a reminder to me that while it's a huge win, you have to be forever vigilant to make sure that it stays there because you know, it can come back. Um, that's it. I'm, I hope that was coherent, but I'm really happy to take any questions if anybody has them. Thank you, Brick. Bear with me while I stop share. There we go. Did I do that right? Yes. Thank you all. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that's the second time I've heard that presentation and uh, it got to me as much as the first. It's um, a really incredible story and um, wonderful to see how you, you know, you talk about your own journey um within that but um you know the part that you played in in such a bigger context to have uh, such a win uh so i think we'll we'll go into some questions i have some um already that some people sent in beforehand uh but i see uh corinna has got her hand up actually no hang on sorry corinne sent me a reminder before uh, i immediately forgot but now i remembered we just want to take a screenshot of everyone um, so if you are comfortable um, showing your, your lovely face, please take yourself, um, please turn your video on so we can get a photo and it's lovely to share with um, on our social media and with our donors to see us all uh, coming together. So bear with me and smile. Check. Check. Yeah, you all look fabulous. I knew it. Um, okay, Corinna, you had your hand up. Would you, do you have a question? Uh, look, I do, I've got heaps. <laughs> but I don't want to jump in ahead of um, others if, if someone else um, has a question too. But I, I'm happy to kick off. So sure. why don't I just kick off? Yeah. Um, Brooke, thank you so much. That was just so interesting and um, illuminating in so many, you know, you think you you think you sort of know and then you hear something like that and you think you, it's such a reminder of what the really important things are I was hoping to start with the very last thing you talked about um about timing and um also this on the ground activity like with the post box because that reminded me of reading a book about Abraham Lincoln who is said to have had success finally because he understood working on the ground um, working with people in small groups and and I just wondered what is our post box opportunity <laughs> what what can do you think is the key to our footwork if you like I, I don't know for you I mean there are and, and only you know for you there are you know as a group um, there might be things particular to vets but there is always a way into these issues that are deeply personal and the most effective way to campaign on. Um, one of our most effective ads was a Call Your Granny campaign where we filmed people calling their grandparents to ask them if they were going to vote for yes. And that was, it was a gimmick, but it was a gimmick because it was incredibly emotionally charged and also uplifting because I think every every gay person has gone through that experience of coming out to your parents and telling you what you're telling out to your grandparents is much more terrifying and when you get that affirmation which most people did from their from their grandparents in a way that they understood how to talk about it you know there's my story with the queers you know the lady at the door um grandparents talk about it in a way that we don't because they were raised in a different era and there is a beautiful way of contextualizing the issue that they have for them. For climate and vets, I don't know, but you have a deep connection to animals. Many rural vets can see firsthand the really damaging effects of climate change. You know, drought-ridden sheep and cattle on farms that are being put down. Farmers, you know, I grew up on a cotton farm. 
not very environmentally friendly, but back in the 90s. And I know that um, farmers have a deep affiliation with their animals, with their land, and you connect into that. And I think that is why you are brilliant messengers for this issue. Um, but really, I can't, I can't, there's not a one size fits all. And if there was, it'd be too easy. But it's the individual story that gets you in here doing this on a Monday night that is the reason that you're an effective messenger. Fantastic. Thank you, Brooke. I think that's a challenge to, to all of us. What, um, what, is our, what is our letterbox? <laughs> what is our letterbox <laughs> moment part of the campaign? Um, I'd be very interested to hear, uh, yeah, people's thoughts on that in the future. Um, we have a question from Kathy. Kathy, did you want to ask your question or I can read it out for you? Sorry, it took me a while to find the unmute button. <laughs> Oh, good. And I'm bouncing on a on a fit ball, which is why I have my video off most of the time. Um, so the hard bit for me really is in feeling like I'm pushing my opinion onto somebody. I'm very good at listening. I'm not very good at telling. Um, and I know that telling probably is the wrong word, but any any tips, thoughts on how you get over that fear of pushing your opinion on somebody who may not really want it? Yeah, I... I have exactly the same fear, Kathy. I am so conflict averse, and so to run a campaign was a very uncomfortable place for me. But I think the first part of telling or helping somebody, uh, you know, in educating is listening, because I think the most important part is to understand the value set from where the person that you're trying to convince is coming from. And if you don't understand, you know, you, you might know that they're. Um, they don't believe in climate change or they don't, they're not ready to do any kind of activism, but you may not fully understand why. And the context around that is really essential to, to getting them across. So the more you can listen um, and understand what it is that the person is trying to tell you, because everybody's trying to tell you something through their, um, through their view, they may not verbalise it, but if they don't believe in something, I can guarantee there will be a reason why. And if you can understand what that is, that makes the in much easier because you're not trying to guess, you know. And this is, I, I have not been working in climate for as long as you have. It's really hard to come at people with science, I think, is my view. Um, climate is something that is up there. I don't feel it every day. It's not about me. It's not about my family. It does have consequences for me and my family, but it is easily dismissible from people. So understanding what your in is in a way that humanises you and humanises the person you're trying to change uh, or to convince or to, you know, to get um, to be an activist with you or just to, you know, the, your version of vote yes, um, I think is the most important thing to do. And that takes time, you know. Listening to people is an investment in time. And, you know, some of the most amazing people I know, vote to know, um, that have come to me since voting no and have either said, I still, I, I really respect what you did, but I still would have voted no. Or they said, I, you know, I've changed my mind subsequently, but at that time I couldn't because of these reasons. Um, and that's been, you know, a, a beautiful process for me to actually kind of stop being so uh, angry at people who don't believe in what I believe in. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. Um, I'll, I'll just elaborate. Actually, since Brooke started, we've just about doubled in numbers. So I might just reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Al and I'm the CEO of Vets for Climate Action. Uh, and I've worked as an environmental and climate campaigner, campaigner for, uh, for the majority of, of my career. Um, and that point that you were talking, Brooke, around, around listening um, to people and understanding where they're at. And I just share, actually, I have on the wall in front of me, um, seek first to understand. Oh, it's the blurs kind of getting that, that out. But um, yeah, I just second that. It's a really important one. And um, uh, it, it can be tricky when it comes to, to an issue which is very close to your heart, no matter what it is, to, um, you know, to hold back, you just 
you don't want to scream and shout about it. <laughs> um, if you're like me, or maybe some people are more conflict diverse, maybe not. Um, but either way, starting with that point of, of understanding where someone else is coming from, um, it's only going to enrich you by understanding someone else, but also it helps you understand what's, you know, what's going to engage them, what's going to change their mind or make them think about it differently. Do they love animals and trees or um, are they concerned about their job or, you know, some other kind of deeper values? Um, so, yeah, I'll just uh, second that. Uh, I want to go next to Kara, if I'm pronouncing your name right, because you got your hand up. And then we've got a few more questions in the uh, chat, which will come to. Over to you, Kara. Thank you. I'm just trying to formulate what I, what I want to say, but thanks to Brick, uh, awesome to hear um, the, your wonderful journey in campaigning, and it's really encouraging. Um, I've done bits and pieces uh, over the last few years, and with a, a different, you know, with different grassroots climate groups, uh, Buddhist, so with the uh, ARC, which are Australian religious climate um, group, and then with uh, the Stop Adani movement, uh, I feel like. How do vets for climate action gain traction? Where do we go? Do we go into the political space? How do we, you know, how do we affect change? I know conversations are important with our clients and with our colleagues, but, you know, after COP26, you know, um, in my hometown, Glasgow, you know, I was jumping up and down, wishing I was there and thinking, ah, oh, you know, seeing Scott Morrison go there and do nothing and bring nothing to the table. And you think this is the government that, you know, they're, they are pro fossil fuels. They are. There's so much that can be done in terms of like, yeah, politically. How do we? Yeah, I just, as a vet, I wanted. I want to do things, but I like, how, how do we get? How do we affect change? How do we do it? Like, do we move into the? I tried in the Stop Adani movement to move into the political space, and it was a disaster. I spoke to Anthony Albanese about the mine up in Queensland. And he shot me down. You know, it was just, I don't know, I'm getting fired up here, but it's like, how do we, how do we do this? How do we do this? <laughs> it's the, I know maybe it's a difficult question to answer, but yeah, I mean, that it's is vets. A... Yeah. All right. No, you, yeah. Yeah. No, look, it, it is a very difficult question. And I understand the frustration and that is part of being engaged in a campaign where you are trying to affect great social change, it is difficult for a reason because it's important. And if it wasn't important, you wouldn't be getting as fired up. I think, you know, you can really divide out. There are, you are one person, but there are different facets to you that can be really effective. So your vote matters, where you put your money matters, how you talk to your clients matters. You know, you're not just a vet and you don't need to politically activate being a vet but there are different facets to how you can do it. I think, you know, for this group, you are uniquely placed as a provider of care to animals to talk about climate change in that context, but that doesn't take you out of other contexts. Um, but I would be careful about mixing different things up with different things. So being a vet doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go into the political sphere as a vet. That may not make sense. You've got to be a little bit strategic about how you go about change. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. And I just posted in the chat as well our one-page strategic plan for Vets for Climate Action, which can, can give a bit more detail on, on that. So, yes, political advocacy is, is definitely part of it. Um, also action within the community. So we have Corinna Klupik, who's on the call today, who is our Climate Smart Project Manager, um, working with clinics to reduce their emissions. Um, we also have a volunteer team who are working um, uh, with big uh, vet and animal care companies to help them reduce their emissions and get more renewable energy procurement. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd second what Brooke was saying about it's... Uh, uh, vets are um, citizens and voters uh, as well, uh, but then also what can you know what can you do particularly as vets and vet nurses and, and animal carers and um, there are a lot of different uh, projects and and campaigns that we have going on that and um, yeah if you have a, a look at that strategic plan that should go some way towards um, answering some of that hopefully if you have any more questions do always feel free to, free to get in touch. 
Um, so let me have a look. We've had a few things going on in the chat. Um, lots of love for Brooke. Uh, and you've posted a few comments with any anything in there that you wanted to say out loud? Oh gosh, there's so much. I just love your presentation, Brooke. I followed the marriage equality campaign. I was enraged. I was, um, I, I, I snail mailed Albo about it because he's my local member and she <laughs> met him at the train station and um, he pulled a Swifty on me because he, he, I had my late dog with me at the time and he said, oh, can, I'll hold your dog. Can you just hold these? And then suddenly I was holding these labor leaflets and his assistant took a photo and it looked like I was <laughs> handing them out. <laughs> I, oh, um, but anyway, I, I guess the, 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 I loved all your lessons and I noticed that even after, you know, the, the, the vote, um, now there's the religious discrimination bill, as I understand. Um, and, 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 you know, so I guess the, the people who are against marriage equality are still still chipping away at it. Um, is there a sense that a lot of the momentum has been lost or is that, do you think that that's gaining momentum uh, as in their side? No, I don't think it's been lost at all. I think, you know, progress is never done. So once you've got it, you've got to fight to keep it because it can, you know, it can um, be peeled back if you're not vigilant about maintaining it. Um, I won't go too much into religious um, discrimination bill, but it is a consistent fight. This is the next. Um, this is the next progression along. You know, there are many things in climate as well that you'll see. You know, getting a twenty fifty net zero announcement by the government is a step. It may not be the step that we want, or it might be not it may not be the best step, but it needs to be celebrated as progress. Getting News Corp to start talking about you know, net zero and green technology and renewable jobs may not have been exactly what we wanted, but it is a step and it should be celebrated because they are the, they're the people who were against it. And if, you know, it's so hard to get discouraged when change doesn't happen as fast as we want it to change. But what we don't do when we are in the middle of it is look back and actually see the change that's coming up the rear. You know, the people who used to be against it, who have changed, once they are the people who are talking about it, in a way that you know activists were ten years ago, you know that it's you know that you're being really effective. Um, it's frustratingly slow, but that's you know that's people. And the other thing is your your um, comment at the end, like Corinna, I was really um, fascinated by the loss from seventy three percent down to the sixty one point six percent, and. Um, I mean, in a way that maybe that was inevitable, but any thoughts retrospectively on how to stop that hemorrhaging of support? Um, do you think it's simply not, not getting involved in sort of antagonistic debates or how do we, how do, we do it? Yeah, I think it is anti, 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 antagonistic debates. I mean, if you, the only other thing that I can kind of replicate that to, and it wasn't a plebiscite, but it was a referendum, was, um, you know, when we, the constitution of the republic, in 1999, when that was announced, we were going to win. That you know, all the city elites were pretty confident that there was a majority in support of a republic. But the, the no campaign was incredibly successful at slowly chipping away that support, and they did it. And it is textbook for any campaign. But they just created questions: who will be the president? Who will it, who you know who will um, vote for the president? How will we elect? Will the people have a say? You know. It was just noise, but it created enough doubt in enough people's minds that that support, the majority support, by the time the vote went through, it was perfectly timed to peel back to be less than 50%. So in terms of, you know, how you stop that, the way that we stopped it was by being laser focused on our message of fairness and equality and not talking about safe schools or children, all those things that they wanted us to talk about, surrogacy and all those things that wasn't actually on the ballot. The thing that we wanted to change was a wording from a man and a woman to two people. And we only ever talked about that because we knew that the minute we got distracted, the country would get distracted and then your campaign is lost. I don't know whether it would have slipped under 50%, but I think it would have slipped more than it did. Yeah, that's a... a I feel that goes back to your point of that 
that very first point you made and what you said was the most important thing is knowing your knowing your why knowing what you're there for and not getting dragged into to other debates and other other conversations which is not which is not your why um yeah that's that's very powerful um i might go to a conversation we had from someone who wasn't able to make it but who sent in a a question uh um, because i think it's a very good one (laughs) so uh the question is from janet janet berry and she asks During the marriage equality campaign, there were many people and their families wanting equality, groups campaigning in the regions, and strong vocal national leadership with legendary leaders. During the climate action campaigning, there are a huge number of people wanting action, many hundreds of climate action groups across the country, but no national leadership for all these groups, no iconic leaders. Why is that? I think it goes back to that point that climate's really hard to personalise. So you can't, and this is the thing that I find hard in drawing the lessons from campaigns that are based around people to a campaign that is based around a thing and drawing that connection between the two. Um, There are people, you know, Greta Thunberg is not an Australian you know, person, but she is somebody who actually has personalised this issue because she is young, she is genuine, and she is so laser-focused on what she wants to do. Um, it's really hard to find people with that genuine authenticity uh, on, the, on the national stage. Um, and maybe the movement isn't there yet. Marriage equality achieved, was achieved, uh, you know, as, as I said, we came in at stages five and six, maybe climate's at a three. And that's at the point where the grassroots organisations are starting to develop. They're starting to really gain some power. Maybe the national umbrella, you know, campaign, the icon, the, you know, the people to be looking to is stage four and five and that's next year. I think it will happen. It may not necessarily be a person, it may be a group, it may be a global movement, there could be something that happens. There is often tipping points around, you know, there could be a natural disaster, there could be the thing that actually tips it off. We all thought the bushfires were going to be that one thing. You take, you know, things like the gun um, gun argument, or Port Arthur in Australia, it's a one thing that tips a movement over and you do get a national leader. In that it was John Howard, the most unlikely candidate, but, you know, you kind of wait for these tipping points and you know what I was saying before is that we as a movement need to put all of the things in place so that when that tipping point happens that nobody knows about everything's ready to go and that's why this kind of collective action these kind of conversations where you talk about the science or talk about campaigning is really essential because when that does happen you already have the information that you need to make sure that you capitalize on it. Thank you, Brooke. Yeah, and I'd I'd add to that. I think it's it's an interesting one comparing the two um, uh, different issues. You're saying you know climate change is is less um, personal, and you know for some be- people it might be something they're experiencing a lot. For for most of us, it, it's not something which affects our our every day. Um, but what's interesting is the extent to which a lot of the big companies and governments are trying to make it a personal issue. And I think that's the the trap which we have to be careful about because that individual action, of course, it makes a difference. Of course, it makes a difference what kind of car you're driving or how often you're you know you're flying, um, but realizing that the most impactful and effective way is to get these changes made by the decision makers at the the top. That's you know that's really the 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 crucial thing, and it. Um, uh, it frustrates and saddens me, you know, every day. And uh, I'm sure many of us have this as well. Close friends of mine or family of mine who consider themselves pretty progressive. My brother, actually, who called me just as we started this seminar. I was talking to him about climate change the other day and he was saying, oh, yeah, we're trying to reduce how much plastic we have in our house. And I was like, oh, like, that's great, but <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's that's an interesting one as well of, of realizing the um, that that uh, the links and the division between the kind of the personal and the collective um, 
and uh, you know the times when they need to be the separate and separate and the times when we do need to work to, together on that um and really yeah just holding these people to account you know we vote them there we put them there and they're meant to be looking after us and 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 all the animals and and creatures that that live in this country so um if you would like to um take action with us uh as i was saying before we have we have a strategic plan which has many different ways you can get involved um there's uh ways you can get involved in uh pushing for better policies um you can uh get your clinic reducing its emissions um and you can be helping uh reduce emissions to the big companies as as well so we're really covering a lot of bases with vets for climate action at the you know political policy level uh down to the level in the clinics and and everything in between um there are lots of opportunities to get involved and uh, we always uh, welcome more more volunteers making that work happen um as an organization we're about 90 percent of the work is done by by volunteers um, so you are all very welcome. Uh, we actually have a petition going at the moment. Um, Corinne has put the link in the uh, chat and I'll just share it again. So this is our um, petition around climate change being an animal welfare issue. And if you sign that petition, you'll join our, our mailing list as well and um, you, can, you can get involved in other ways. Uh, if you're, there we go, Corinne has put in a link for Climate Smart as well. So that's the program, um, getting clinics reducing their emissions and improving sustainability. Um, and yes, we welcome volunteers or, uh, you know, even if you just want to join the mailing list um, or donate, uh, any way you're, you're getting involved is, uh, you know, being a member of Vets for Climate Action. And we very much appreciate it. Uh, and finally, Thank you so much to Brooke. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving um, this time on your Monday evening to speak with us. Um, and just thank you for everything you did in that campaign and everything you're doing now in the climate movement. It is, um, uh, the climate movement is all the richer uh, in, um, uh, in many ways for having you in it. So thank you. Thank and you thank so you much. all for attending this evening. Um, the recording will be available in a few, a few days time. And we'll send that round and feel free to share it with anyone who you think might find this um find this interesting thanks all uh can i ask anyone who's involved in the organization of the webinar just to 